Mm -hmm. Hey, um, so this is going to be just a little bit more of a departure here. This last one that we're going to go, it's going to Glenn Rhodes. And generally they are just like Aberlauer. They're just really smooth, um, space side, sweet, gorgeous, gorgeous stuff. I think they're space side. I should have checked that up. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, the Glenn Rhodes. Um, but this is a peated one, which is an unusual thing to um, see from them. It's very lightly peated. It's, uh, you know, Inverness peat. It's not Isla peat. So it's going to be more full of like, you know, pine trees and mm. heather more than, you know, the iodine and seaweed that you get from a, an Isla whiskey. And it's lightly peated too. So um, you want iodine in your whiskey? Oh my God. There, I mean, there is, yes. What? If, like, again, you have to like the peated whiskeys to, to like this, but when I first had my first lag of Vulin and I got the iodine and I got the Band-Aid and I got all of these things that, and campfire and most, exactly, your face is exactly what most people well, experience when they have that. how do you know what iodine tastes like? Because you've smelt it. You know, yeah, just the way, yeah. you know, like with white wine, the, the fresh green branch break, I get that in, in white wine, but oh. I've never tasted a branch. Interesting. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you get these sense memories of all these things that you've smelt or tasted or, or experienced. And it just, it, sometimes it comes out in these things. So and I guess that's what I mean is maybe for having been a smoker for so long, I even have a hard time hmm. with a sense memory, like, cause I didn't have a lot of that, you know? Right. But it may be, well, no, cause I was, I was probably smoking when I first had a lag of Vulin cause that was my twenties. Okay, the nose. Yeah, it's this is so interesting because you. It, it's I once again I'm a huge fan of the peat, but you get that peat, but it is like you like you're saying the pine, and it's like it's a different kind of peat in there. Yeah, this is like I feel like I'm standing in a like a redwood forest. Like I yeah, feel like this totally. is uh, yeah, there's, there's like a cabin, a cabin in a redwood forest. That's what that that's what this house is. The canopy is like all over all these. Sequoia. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah. Just a big glade with pine needles and pine cones and leaves and rotting vegetation. Maybe like, um, you know, like some, some cabins, maybe a summer camp. Did you just try tasting it, Jessica? No. Oh. Woo! Well, yeah, that's got some burn to it. And it's just forty percent. Only forty percent. Yeah, I know That's we've had at to sixty-two me. that did not taste as alcoholic as this. That's so interesting. Now I'm really interested to see what what science is going to do to it. That's so. It's so interesting to get that peat, like, because I feel like it's more in the nose than the flavor. Like, I'm not getting a lot of flavor from it. I, um, I get like um a shepherd's pie crust. So why peat? Well. Largely peat is in the whiskey because they need to germinate the barley to get it to start shooting a root out, but not before, and then that starts to converting the starch to sugars. But before it consumes all those sugars, they need to stop it from germinating. So what they do is they put it in a kiln, which, which dries it with heat. Now on the mainland, there's plenty of wood, so they could burn wood fires to, to dry it. But on the islands, not so many trees but the ground is on its way to becoming coal. So if you dig down into the ground, you can get this compressed vegetable matter that's not quite coal yet. So it doesn't burn uh, as dark and oily as that, but it still burns kind of oily and smoky. And as that dries the, the barley, it kind of coats it with these fennels, with these, these smoky campfire-like smells that you get and tastes that you get. And that then gets ground up into the, in the mill and in, in, you know, the grist for them, that's the grist that goes into the mill. You get grist out, you get uh, flour out, you get um, some other stuff. I can't remember all three components, but you get all these things and you take these cuts and these percentages of it, you put in this, in this crappy, uh, you put it in a very nice, sorry, not a crappy, you put it in a mash tun where it gets brewed into beer, a really crappy beer. That's what comes out of it. This beer that is sweet and that you would never want to really drink. It's, it's kind of awful. Um, but that then goes into the, um, the washbacks, all these big tubs where it sits and ages and, and they add the yeast and it ferments and it ferments and becomes, becomes this beer. And then that goes into the low wine still, which gets distilled from like about 7% up to about 14%. And then that low wine that comes out of that gets go into the 
um, spirit still, where it gets distilled up to 74 to 68% alcohol, and that gets the center cut that goes into the, um, into the output. But anything higher than 78, I can't remember what it is, 76, 78% that comes off, um, has these um, alcohols in it, which are not good for us to drink. That's the stuff that makes you go blind, which is why moonshiners would often cause people to have all these issues is they wouldn't, they wouldn't remove that top cut. They go, oh, this is great alcohol. We can't, we have to keep it. It's like, no, there's bad stuff in that alcohol. Um, but that stuff, that stuff they, they take off and most distilleries will sell that to medicine or chemistry um, plants that need these high octane kind of alcohols. They'll take the center cut and they'll put that back and they'll put that into barrels and, and do it. And the low, but when it drops below a certain percentage, like 68% or something like that, they'll take that, they'll put it into a, a little spirit safe and then pump that back into the stills for the next distillation, hoping to get it, it reduced um, down. So it, it becomes, you know, from 40%, it goes up to 60% or something. They can reuse it in the, in the bottling. So um, I, I know I've ranted about this a bunch, but it, it tends to be, except for the heat that they need to do, um, they need to create all of the stuff. It tends to be a very kind of low, in terms of a green enterprise, it's a tremendously green enterprise. Huh. Now, okay. It takes about a hundred gallons of water to make one gallon of whiskey. So in that regard, maybe not green because they're boiling so much of it off. They're creating, they're turning water into to vapor a lot and they're cooling things with the water and they're, you know, but if steam and, you know, that, I mean, that's their, their biggest. Yeah. It's all, it's all relative. Like, cause we also, there's, we also are treating water as a, as a renewable source. And in some ways it is, but it's also like Mexico city is treating water. Like it's a commodity and, and it shouldn't be, you know, like the, we're, we're, well, plus, the, yeah, we're draining the aquifers. So, and those well, are, those and are I think that's not, what I mean is, those are not renewing as quickly as we're not, as need, we as we're pay, them, yeah. We don't pay for water in the way that in the, in the, at the price it should be paid for. Um, but again, that's, a, but then a, like, who, who do we pay for the water? You know, who owns fucking it? Fucking guy is, and Nestle the, is like trying to make, Nestle, is trying to Nestle, privatize Nestle. water, which is, Cray cray. Well, you know, you can help that by never accepting a bottled water. Never oh, drink a bottled water, I'm never accept you. a bottled water. Yeah, I'm gonna, about, I'm gonna I'm gonna put a little science in this. Pot. Speaking of water, I'm gonna water put some water in the in this. I'm, I'm gonna try it. I'm interested to see what you say because I don't know that I want to. Yeah, no, that I understand that. Question. But I'm gonna try it. Yes. I'm gonna put a drop in. Yes, Aka. Yes. How good it is actually versus oh well we really want to get drunk so let's try and find the <laughs> positives about it i think when it first started there was probably just like well we need to distill the stuff we need to you know kiln the the barley we we must use peat it becomes it becomes a flavor that you kind of look for because it's a very unique flavor you get with this alcohol um so, it, I mean, it, it's hard to say. I have had some peated alcohols that are not great. They're not, they're not well made, they're not well structured. Um, and then I've had ones that are completely lyrical, com just transport me to a flavor that I've never felt in my mouth before. So, I, I, you know, it's, it's the skill of the person putting it together or the people putting it together. So I accidentally put three drops in here. <gasps> You've ruined I it. Like I like the nose, like with the water in, I put a drop of water in this. The nose to me, although it, I, this is what it reminds me of, like a rec room, and it reminds me of painting miniature Dungeons and Dragons figures as a kid. Like it smells like paint to me, but that very specific, like like miniature paint and the primer that you would put on the-, on oh. the um... so, so Jessica, what do you find with three drops? Honestly, it's, it's, it's enjoyable. And it, I, do, I do sense the opening up of it too. It, it definitely felt like, uh, an unfolding happened. Um, so you've actually said positive things about a peated whiskey. I, I like so, it. Yeah, yeah I, I, I like I, it with the water. I didn't think I was going to hate it. I, I, I think well, what I'm trying to illustrate is up until a couple years ago, I oh, would have not been able to. You would have avoided it, yeah. Well, yeah, but also I was getting fed like Glenn Fittich and stuff like that. Like, so that's a highly peated thing and you're not ready for that, you know? The Glenn Fittich shouldn't be highly peated. Yeah. Then I'm wrong. Whatever I was given. But you're, you're the... probably a Lefroy or a Lagavulin, I'm guessing. I, I be, whatever it was, I wasn't, my palate wasn't ready for it. And, but also I'm not going to sit here and, and drink gin either. You know what I right. mean? Right. Like, 
but again, I, you, you're enjoying this, which is a lightly peated, uh, very sweet, very kind of Highland Speyside kind of style whiskey. It's not, you're still not going to be ready for the Isla. If you still try the Isla whiskeys, you're still going to kind of go, oh my God, I'm drinking Well, I would love to logs. based off of what we're doing here. And like, I would have loved like a fifth one just to go, okay, well, Damn let's it. see how, how, no, it's okay. Well, we should have put we, a, should have put a lag of Ulan in there. Yeah. I should I just need to come back. Oh, well, that works. <laughs> um, well, no, I guess what I mean is. I, I'm readier. I'm more. I'm more primed for this stuff now. It's time. I, and I would order this. Hmm. I would go to the bar in lieu of my. This is the first one in lieu of everything that I would actually. That you would order. actually order. Yeah. The, the yeah. problem it is, is you're good... not likely to see this at many bars. Nah. This is this is a great though. This is a great like for someone who is not into peat but would like to try it. Like this is so good for that because it's just like soft it's just like let me let me let me introduce you to my friend Pete. You're not gonna like spend <laughs> the night with him. You're no. just gonna meet him, and, and you're gonna have some conversationalist. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't conversationalist. Was it conversationalist? <laughs> I guess also too, in fairness, the kind of drinker I am is usually let's get drunk. Like I'm a binge drinker or. I've, I've not been drinking during the during COVID because I I'm a social drinker as well. Like I'll try to have a glass of whiskey here, and I'm like, what the fuck am I? What am I even doing? Yeah. But. And, and honestly, this is why I do this here is because the stuff sits on my shelf otherwise, unless I can have a social occasion. It is nice. This is it's, it doesn't taste bad when I'm talking to three people about it. You know, <laughs> it's a very strange thing. But you're talking to three shared. people. There's cats Who's the in other the room? person. They, 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 they put an overcoat on and yeah. <laughs> they're like one person they're like we are just human going to get tuna now <laughs> help us with can opener oh. i think i'm counting me in the video <laughs> like, what? you know when i have a whiskey with myself your... it's often better what, what do you think of this andrew with the water in it what do you i like it with I'm... the water i feel like there's there's some more interesting stuff going on I think I'm neutral with water. I just feel like there's a little more finesse in the flavor. There's a little more complication. There's some other stuff going on there's, that there's wasn't like quite there before. Sweet at the at the tip of the tongue. The peat kind of like rounds, like it's rounding in the mouth, but not in a in a bad aftertaste way. Mm -hmm. Like the peat comes back. It's like oh hello. Yeah. <laughs> and, and just like a Did you roasted about me. Don't do that. <laughs> a roasted vegetable in that as well. Just something's been in the oven and has been like with on on rosemary or fennel or something, just like a little. Oh. Ooh, apple pie. Maybe. Because the sweetness in there, and a little tiny tiny background of citrus bite, which might be an apple. Yeah. Yeah. This is a good scotch. I like this. I, I think I guess I'm thinking caramelized or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something caramelized. Like there's a little brown sugar in with yeah, the Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. I do feel like the water takes a bit of that fire out of it. And I like that. Like, because the fire was pretty strong. Surprisingly strong for a 40%. I know, right? <sighs> oh, what's your tongue? What's going on? <laughs> oh, no, it's just a lot of experiences. And a little bit of tips. And I really think I look so pretty right now. And so I'm like, I just look good. <laughs> <laughs> does, does this you always look with, pretty, Jessica. I'm pretty? so lonely. <laughs> <laughs> That's the flirting behavior of Jessica, is it? <laughs> I, I, like, I get the attention of two It's hands subtle. It's men. subtle. You have to really pay a look for it to see. It, 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 it really is. It is. I, I got to get my thrills somehow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I'm certainly not fishing for the pretty compliment. Thank you. Uh, You're quite lovely. Come on. I'll take please. it. I did come to the conclusion that I could simultaneously be the prettiest and ugliest person in in like a switch of a hat. Like, it, it, and I don't mean it like, but it's like someone, someone once <laughs> called me like the woman of a thousand faces. And like, I, 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 all of a sudden there could be something happening on my face that it's clown-esque. It's scary. And it's, it's okay. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm saying it's going to make me more I think, successful. 
I think anyone can easily look unattractive if they want to. That's what I think. And I think if you're an improviser, it's it's more accessible to you. But I think like being unattractive is easier than being attractive. Like being attractive, you kind of mm -hmm. have to, you know, have the stuff you need to be attractive. It just has to, you just have to have it. And then, but like yeah. I can, anybody can make themselves unattractive. Well, it's so, like it's easier to destroy something than to make something, you know. I, I, I did that through my throughout my twenties. I played hard to want. You what? Say that again. Oh, the joke fell flat so bad. Hard okay. to. Okay. A lot of people play hard to get. I played hard to want. Oh. I made myself unattractive. No. Jesus. So I remember, like, I guess I was super insecure in my twenties as well, and like going to bars was all about like who's gonna pay attention to me. Oh, but that girl's so pretty. That girl's so pretty. And then I, I played an experiment with myself because I realized how like unhealthy it was to go to the bar as seeking validation or someone's attention because I wasn't focusing on the time with my friends yeah. or yeah. I would go home feeling bad because I didn't get hit on. Again, that just wasn't my 20s. So that, that next time I went out to the bar, I, I tried to actively look for the unattractive girl so that I could find her and go, okay, well, at least I'm prettier than her, right? Oh and my like, God, that's- No, 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 no. Just, just wait for me, just wait. I wanted to make sure, I wanted to see, am I, am I the one that's ugly here, so that's why I'm not getting hit on, or are there no ugly girls? My, my conclusion was that there actually aren't ugly people in this world, and, I, and it's, we're all crazy to think that I'm the only ugly person and I would like say that to other girlfriends who'd be like, oh my God, I'm so ugly. I'm like, look around the bar. Do you see an ugly girl? And she goes, no. I was like, well, like, what makes you think you're the ugly girl then? And- Because everyone else is pretty. And, and it's amazing the comparison that you draw against yourself towards other people. And, and as that theory has matured for me, I realized I've never met an ugly person unless that person is ugly on the inside. I've, I, I, most, everyone I know are like, I, they're the prettiest person, they're the sweetest and you know, cutest. And then when they treat someone like shit, I'd be like, oh, fuck her hair. What's mm -hmm. wrong with her nose? Mm -hmm. Or he's like, he's like, but only because their insides are ugly. So you know what I mean? Like confidence goes a long way and kindness goes a long way towards so I, attractive. I can relate to that in that, um, in improvisation. So when I first started, I was very much aware of how good everyone else was. And that's mm -hmm. all I could focus on. And, but once I turned inwards and said, no, I have to actually express a character. I don't care what it is. Then I started to become a better improviser. Um, and I won't claim to be the best, but it's just, just that change of focus. And I think that is also true of people that if you can focus inwards and say, oh, I'm going to focus on who I am and what I want to do and how I want to express myself in the world. Boom, you will be suddenly become so much more attractive to everyone. It's, it's a weird, it's, it's that weird thing. Like, don't think about the blue elephant and this magic carpet will fly and all you can think about is a blue elephant. Yeah. The, the converse of that though, and, and from the school that we've all taken, um, if you take the focus off of yourself and just focus on like, how do I make Joseph look awesome? How do I make Andrew look awesome? You could also be doing yourself a favor. And mm -hmm. some of the most attractive people are those that listen to people or don't give you too much of themselves or remain a mystery. So it is finding the balance. You actually gave me one of the weirdest compliments I've ever get, get, been given, Andrew, that threw me for a loop. What? You, you systematically went through each Ripley and kindly said what you <laughs> thought of each of us after you had guessed it with us. And this was actually said, before I guessed it with you, but yes, yes. Before, okay, okay, fuck you. So you just said- correct, I'm just correcting you because you were wrong. <laughs> okay, that's what I mean. <laughs> so you, exactly, that's, you said, I want to be able to make improv mistakes like Jessica. <laughs> Wonderful improv mistakes like Jessica. It was. I you, said, because oh, here's, here's the, that's such a great that is such a great improv compliment it's though like you know it always oh, and it's, it's completely how why I love watching her. you on stage it's just like you will you will get into such trouble and then everyone else will go absolutely that's totally correct and just like it be, it becomes the core of what this the show is about is like that little mistake became the entire show and and it's it's one of those wonderful things where you just kind of go yeah I can't be perfect just accepting that and just I mean. I, yeah, so no. I meant it completely as a compliment. And now I take it as a compliment. I, I went, I have personally gone through a journey of, holy shit, I'm surrounded by incredible improvisers. I'll never be able to do that. And this was happening to me in the show. I, and I had to make me, it had to make me like impossible to play with because of this. The, I would walk off from a Ripley show and be like, I was horrible. 
and, and I'm trying not to give it to them, but that's where my mentality was. And, and instead, since having that compliment, it's now been a great way to, okay, well, you know what? I followed my instinct and boy, that was a mistake. And what a joyous mis mistake that was. And, and I love, my mom told me two weeks ago, she's like, Jessica, you're not a good improviser. And I said, I don't give a fuck what you think, mom, because I think she's wrong. She's and wrong, I know I'm not good at She's thinking you have to be perfect. She's thinking you have to be, you know, just quick-witted or whatever. And that's not, that's yeah, not. If you, if you hold up like, you know, like the people on whose line is in any way as the sort of people who are the best improvisers, then you're, you're doing it. You're looking at the wrong, you're looking at the wrong way. Because first long, of all, those people thing. are all very clever and funny. Number one. Number two, they, t they shoot a bunch of footage and they, they edit it down edited. to the funniest parts. Yep. No one, no one is as funny as those people. And then like, even, you know, John Stone would always say like, like Robin Williams was amazing. He was brilliant. I wouldn't want him to be in my improv company because he, you know, no one can live up to that. Like it's not, it, yeah. it's, it's not, a, it's never going to be about a, an ensemble if he's in the cast, it's going to be about him. And that's yeah. not what improv is about, you know? Yeah. It's great. Like, it's like, that's awesome for him, you know? And uh, that's but, his trajectory, right? Like yeah. that's where he will soar. I, I know personally that I was drawn to improv because I was so afraid to be vulnerable in performance. I'm great with scripts. I was great. You know, I, I wasn't ready to be in front of camera. I, and I look at my training as not just like, here's this skill that I gained. Here's this skill. It's take away that thing that you're afraid about, of. Take away that thing that you're afraid of so that I can just be on stage. You know, like very rarely now does something make me nervous, uncomfortable, make me feel out of my element. But improv does. It does just puts you in this like a couple of times this year when we were about to do encounter i'm like well wh what if i forget how to speak english <laughs> like i was certain that was going to happen and it just is not but it, there's the, uns the the fact that there is absolutely no safety net was a training i had to go through in order to know that even failure was a successful yeah. tool yeah. or it was a, a way to be successful i have a question for you okay We've had like a few different whiskeys today, um, four whiskeys. Um, after tasting them, what do you think? Do you do you like whiskey? Oh, oh. Um, I don't like whiskey. I I, I fucking, fucking love, love whiskey. whiskey. I love whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I really I really am grateful to have personal, personally more knowledge on what I like and why. And, and honestly, this, this is just getting better. The last one. Yeah, that's really and, good. And I mean, this is, this is not the most extraordinary whiskey out there. I, I think, you know, if you come back on, I will curate some stuff that is just, you know, the scotch that I think you will like. Um, because I mean, if if you if this was accessible to you, I, I think there's other stuff that is just, and it will just open up this experience of tastes and and yeah, I don't know. I'd really love to do like a, a Scotch flight and see what like the different ranges of it as oh, well. Oh yeah, because it can be like I mean, Joseph went over it earlier, but you know, there's there's a lot of taste ranges. Like I think bourbon is like about this, and I think wine is maybe here, and beer is here, and then whiskey to me just there's flavors in whiskey you don't get anywhere else and and that's what kind of excites me about it mm. and honestly what's your feelings on i've never had it but um un, uncasked whiskey so like a uh, clear whiskey uh that i think in most jurisdictions that would not count well actually bourbon doesn't have a, a age limit um i mean that's basically moonshine that's basically new Got mixed it. spirit. That's the stuff that just comes off the still. So I have a question for you two. How do you, how, how well do you think you made it seem like you know about whiskey? I think I mostly got through there, but there's a couple of times you called me out and I felt like, uh, you know, I was back at Impro 101 and just not doing it right. But I was just making up, I was just making up bullshit. I wasn't even trying. That's what I'm saying. That's the whole lesson of the, the day. Oh. Oh. Wow. You know nice. what I mean? Thank you for the validation. You're welcome. We, you guys are great. 
we've learned to delightfully fail. Jessica has taught us how to how to delightfully fail. I'm, I'm great... gonna I'm gonna like be in bed tonight going, why did I say those things? <laughs> <laughs> 